I had my father was a huge Looney Tunes fan. My whole family was a huge Looney Tunes fan. So I was introduced to Bugs Bunny from a very early age. And I got to grow up with you as Bugs Bunny. Like, and it, this is, this gets to be really cool for me. Oh, that's so awesome. That's great. That's great. That's so great. Have you, now, I, the other question I wanted to ask you, I mean, you're going to ask me questions, but um, I did a uh, salute to Warner Brothers 100 years. Mm. And so I did 100 days of impersonations every day consistently consecutively starting April 4th and the last day was July 12th. So if you want to check that out, if you haven't seen that, you can check it out on Instagram, TikTok, but it's, it was really fun. And I got amazing like responses like that. I never imagined. Um, You don't realize what I guess. I mean, I always think of myself as the fan so, you know, whether it's of Mel Blanc or Adam West, people that I grew up with, I never really think of myself that anybody could ever think that way about me. Well, they told me different. Um, holy cow. I, I was so, I mean, so touched. Well, um, I, yeah, I kind of speaking there on the fact that you did so many impressions during that bit. Which response surprised you the most? Because I, I can imagine, you know, you bust out folks, you got people like me freaking out, but like, what character oh, oh. were you surprised about? Like, that you, people were like, oh my God. Um, oh, okay. Well, I, there were three that really surprised the heck out of me. Um, I was the voice of the Hawaiian Punch Punchy in the in the early 90s. And uh, hey, how about a nice Hawaiian punch? Fruit juicy. And pe- people went like crazy over that. I just thought, well, I'll put that on there just as something fun. And then I did uh, Roger Rabbit. Hello there, Roger Rabbit. It's me and Debbie Hammond. I mean, I, I got a like a crazy response from from that. I never expected to get that. Um, and of course, Fred Flintstone. Oh, Gio, you you know the way the girls are, Fred. <laughs> and I did a you know, Rabbit Debbie, you. And and people were, I don't know, they were just like bonkers over that. So, <laughs> it, 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 you know, you never really know, like, is anybody watching? Is anybody listening? You know, I mean, so much stuff out there, so, many, so much content happening. So, um, but it was very, um, it, it was, it was amazing, actually. Um, and then I did a voice that I had done, I had created as an announcer voice for the Boomerang Cartoon Network mm-hmm. in the 90s. And that was the biggest overwhelming post of all. It was the, this is the Jetsons. The Jetsons will return after these messages on Boomerang from Cartoon Network. People, Brandon, I'm telling you, like I got a thousand or more, um, you know, comments. Just my God, you're my childhood. That's you. You, you're that voice. It's you. It, 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 it's just hilarious. I, I love that you said that. And as we were doing that voice, I could hear the music sting that goes with it. Like I was sitting there, like, yeah, no, I remember that. <laughs> so that you know that too. Yeah. Okay. So you know that too. Yeah. And it's funny because it's people, I guess, in their, you know, somewhere between twenty five and thirty two. Like there's that sweet spot of those kids that came home from school and that was their cartoon jam, you know, in the afternoon. I, so. I, I am 32. I'm part of that group. My sister's and my sister's 20, uh, 28. She's also like, we, we grew up on cartoon. Network. That was a big thing. Both of our parents uh, were. So that was a big thing for us. So I started doing more posts with the boomerang announcer you know, just because people were like, come on, you got to bring it back. So I said, it's all coming back to you. <laughs> so, that needs to be Max right now. That's just what leads it. Anytime you click a cartoon in Max, I just want to get the floor right. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so cute. Oh, my God. Uh, but speaking of all the all the, all the the voices, uh, we are here a little bit to talk about bugs and a little bit about metal. And Absolutely. Just- uh, and I did kind of want to start with the fact that you have been voicing bugs now for over 30 years. And thank you, like, it's been, you know, since 1989 that you got to kind of take over that role and we kind of embrace that role. So looking at what you've done, the, all the time you've got to play bugs, all the different kind of interpretation of bugs, because 
you know, you look at some of, this, uh, some of the horror. <laughs> I always go back to the, the horror on the invasion of the of the ter- of the butt snatches. Uh, you know that you are good. That that was a, that was like a personal favorite as a kid. Uh, that, was, right. that, was, that one freaked yeah. the hell out of me as a kid. You just your stock went way up. You can interview me anytime now. You know that. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Um, and then you look at some like Space Jam. You look at some all the different kind of uh, you know, versions of bugs that you've gone to play and play with. What do you think is kind of the key to them? What is, what is kind of the thing that you like latch onto when you need to get into character with them, regardless of how you're gonna what the scenario, what the situation, what the kind of thing around them is? Well, certainly referencing Mel Blanc, and I was fortunate to meet him in 1981 and spend about 45 minutes or so with him. So that in and of itself is kind of remarkable. It's like that sort of washes over me and has stayed with me for 42 years now. So it was very interesting because it was a, it was an odd time in July of 1989, Mel passed away eerily enough on my birthday. And then three weeks later, they're casting for Tiny Toons and Spielberg and Amblin and Warner Brothers. They auditioned thousands of people. They weighed in on it and they picked me. I mean, we all had to audition on cassette or reel to reel. And and so it was like one character was like, well, I did Bugs and then I got Bugs and then Elmer and then Daffy, and then Foghorn and then Yosemite and then Sylvester and Tweety. So it was it, the, what I didn't really expect is how different the character would evolve because different directors. So my first, I think, director probably might have been Chuck Jones. It was very early on that I met him at this recording studio because he was directing the title sequence of Bugs and Daffy at the beginning of Gremlins 2. And so I was very nervous. I mean, here's the guy that created Daffy Duck, my guy. And so he was so organized, so prepared. He knew exactly what he wanted in every single read. And what I noticed was he played off into a lot of subtlety, which is something that not necessarily was the case following, you know, many years after that. But again, it was the man who created these characters and and worked with with Mel. So I think that impacted and informed his direction so much with me. So that was a great training ground. And then uh, meeting Steven Spielberg and hey, am, am I doing okay? Am I, I mean, he's, you're doing great. Keep up, keep up the good work. And so, but then, you know, through the years, not only do the directors change, but we went from analog recording to digital recording. And of course, digital recording is so much better in terms of the, the uh, what you can do with a digital recording and how clean it is. However, on the uh, on the flip side, it's not as it doesn't have as much character. Everything kind of sounds very similar with a digital recording. So um, a lot of times when you'll watch cartoons, it, it's just like it, it, they kind of blend in almost, you know. And so when you hear stuff that was recorded in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, it's all analog. And they're using some of the greatest microphones that were ever created. So, the, you know, these are things, technologies that you have to think about. But with me, the consistent thing with me is I I have a catalog in my head of references from the same things that you're watching, whether it was from the Bugs Bunny Tweety show, any cartoon, any commercial, anything that's out there, that's that's part of what's in my head. And, and so I have that to reference, which is really a beautiful, which is a great thing. My mental Rolodex has just got to be beautiful. Yeah, I'm going to be like, I'm gonna, all right, let's do a little bit from this one. <laughs> a little bit from that. Uh, that, that. Kind of speaking, too, a little bit about meeting with Mel, so I've read about that. About, uh, you spoke in the, in the boss about that meeting, which just, oh, my God, that's, that's wild getting to meet Mel Blanc, talking about those voices with him at that age. What surprised you the most about Mel? Like, getting to actually kind of speak with him and talk to him and see beyond, like, so many people like me. Whenever we hear Mel Blanc, we just go, yeah, I, I just play movie tunes in my head. What, what, was, what surprised you about getting to meet the man behind the two? Well, to me, he was a big celebrity, Brandon, because when I met him, I didn't meet him as like necessarily the voice of Bugs Bunny, even though that was his big thing. I knew him from the Jack Benny program. 
because he would be he played the plumber and the postman. He'd always play like the, the that guy, you know, um, that would show up that would say, yeah, all right, uh, I'm here to fix. Uh, I'm here to fix the pipes, Mr. Benny. <laughs> and I would say, God, that sounds kind of like, you know, sort of like bugs, but not. And so I was just gobsmacked when I met him. And he was he was like really nice. He was a regular guy. I mean, one of the things he said to me is now don't do impersonations, whatever you do, don't ever Im- imitate anybody. Oh my God. Of course I didn't listen to what he said. Obviously. <laughs> you took that as a challenge. <laughs> oh my God. You took that oh as a dare. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I do remember doing some of his contemporaries. I, I think I did uh, George Burns. And I and I and I I, I did a little of that and pretend to smoke a cigar and 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 you know he said oh that's great but always create your own voices if you can so at the time I didn't do bugs or any of the vo- I, it was maybe it wasn't until maybe three four months after I met him that I I just started to just hear the Looney Tunes characters in a different way and I started working on them I, I would never have imagined that eight years later I'd be on doing Bugs Bunny for Tiny Tunes. <laughs> I, I just, I'm also still breaking it up. I love Johnny Tunes, was also a big one. I got to go up. Uh, every time I get to talk about that sort of stuff, I get very excited. Um, now, I do also love that you get, you're getting the opportunity uh, with Noel as well to kind of really get to, to honor Mel's legacy and Mel's history. Because Mel is one of those people I feel like is in the, undeniably a part of pop culture. Even if you do, even if you didn't grow up watching Looney Tunes, you know that more. You know those characters. You know what that is. And that is, like, he's one of those figures that, and of the Chuck Jones as well. It's like, you know, these people who created stuff that we've been keeping, people like this, get uh, artists like we've been getting to keep alive. People like me have been geeking out <laughs> their entire lives. Uh, what does it mean to you to kind of get to honor those, that legacy and that, those stories with stuff like movie legends and conversation? Like, what does it mean to you to, like, not only continue the, the, the spirit of these characters and so you know in your modern work and what you've done but like also just to honor the, the creatives behind it too it's a great question brandon and i i appreciate it very much because in a way it is enabling all of us to hold on to our childhoods and if you hold on to a little bit of your childhood you, you stay young you stay youthful and for me i just didn't want to let that go so whether it was bugs bunny or fred flintstone or barney rubble it didn't matter it's just a part of keeping that and holding that i mean i have an image of me sitting on the sofa with chocolate milk and cheese doodles on saturday morning watching scooby doo and just like everybody else did and so like you don't, you don't really want to let that go who wants to live completely in the real world. And, and I can't even imagine that, you know, Mel and Chuck and first freeling ever thought in the forties and the fifties that 60, 70, 80 years later, that we still would be loving these characters in in one incarnation after another. So I'm, I mean, for me, it's, it's not only a career, but it's just, it's getting to play and have fun and still doing that. At you know, at, at for more than thirty for thirty three years, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> it's I, incredible. I, I love it, and, that, and that's and like I. It's just speaking to like the fact that like it's when I was a little kid, I did not think you could kill a duck. I thought if you shot a duck, his bill just spun around and he fixed it. I thought that was real life. Uh, <laughs> like one of the it's true. you can't you can't kill a duck. It's not possible, Brandon. It just isn't possible. I'm going to show that to my wife later. and She's going to be very tough. Uh, my mother's going to love that. <laughs> it sounds like that was a favorite thing about little kid. He was like committed to like, don't talk to that. Just walk off. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And then like we got my, my little kid blanket was Bugs. And that, I've got the blanket to give to my son now. Like it's, I can die. See? You know, like, a big toss in my life, <laughs> like it's a big thing. See, uh, that's tradition. So- yeah. Well, and let me ask, address your other question too about the the Looney Legends in, mm-hmm. in conversation. That was really a very unexpected thing. Oh my gosh! That here I found out just recently that I live eight minutes if I make the all the, all the traffic lights to Mel Blank's son, Noel Blank, who is absolutely 
just a delight and so smart and so funny. And I don't even know if he knows how funny he is sometimes, but we have just become really such good friends. And I just, I just, I, I want to eat him up. I love him. He's so adorable and cute and he's got the greatest, funniest stories. Um, he's such a pleasure to be with. And, and he just w- really welcomed both my wife and I and, and the four of us, his wife, Catherine, we've all become great friends. And so, and it's a part of history that he's still very much um, connected to and has some of the most amazing stories. And he's the last and only surviving uh, blank that there is. There, there aren't any more, you know, relatives. Oh, wow. That's, I didn't realize that. That's, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's just, that, that, that's just such a, not necessarily a damper, but that really does just kind of put the reality of the situation of this is how Mel gets to live on, is through those stories, is through you get, as, and the world, Mel getting to tell those stories. Like that, that allows Mel to continue to exist in some form, which is really beautiful in a way. Uh, well, you know, it, it, it really is because some of these things have never been told. I mean, I asked him questions uh, that I didn't think anybody asked him. And and some things, you know, obviously have been out there, but he's so fascinating. He got to know, I mean, I mean, you could probably say that Jack Benny might as well have been like his surrogate dad or uncle. He was so close to Jack Benny and George Burns and would sit on um Gracie Allen's lap and and he met Marilyn Monroe and Rita Hayworth. They would they would sort of fuss over him as a little kid when Mel would bring him to the studio uh to record and he just he Clark Gable I mean you you name the celebrity he probably met them and if not you know I mean he lived across the street from Gene Kelly um I mean it, it it's 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 unbelievable the amount of uh Hollywood luminaries and and you know celebrity icons that we just look at I mean, I mean Elvis Presley I mean it just the list goes on and on and and so uh, it's a pleasure to to know him and and um, and hopefully our proof of concept project will end up being either a film, a short film, a documentary, a series, because there's so much, so much to tell. We had to just kind of condense it all down to like five and a half, six minutes. Oh, if you need if you need a cheerleader for it, or just somebody with a cartoonishly deep voice to be a cheerleader for it, I'm watching it. <laughs> yeah, I, I always go to my, my joke is always that I sound like a cartoon owl who's about to tell you where to find the lost sword of gobbledygook. Uh, <laughs> that's just how I sound. <laughs> I love it. Good for you. That's the way you got to be. It's the oh, way I, you got to be. I'm somebody, there was one event I was at once where somebody saw me and I overheard them being like, it's like it's a cartoon. It's like, yeah, that's <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, when I would talk to Chuck Jones or you, you even would hear for his feeling talk, these characters were real. They weren't cartoons to them. They were real. They were three dimensional. And 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 it's like you kind of look at them and think, like, are these guys playing with the full day? De- are these guys, do they know what they're saying? But I ended up kind of getting caught up in it myself. You know, I'll, I'll look at something that I've done over the years and go. Oh yeah, that that there it is real, sort of, but not, but is, you know, and so there's like the suspension between what's real and what's not real. And and I I kind of like that, you know. I, I kind of like that we've all just been part of this world, you know. You too, you know, we keep it alive. We all keep it keep it going. I love I think it's I think it's South Park that does a whole bit where they bring up like sometimes characters like that are more real than us. Like they, they make a point of like. How much impact has Luke Skywalker had on somebody's life? That's not more impact than I. It's I mean, true, that's... yes. And impactful, yes. Oh, God, I love it. I, I've really, really got small questions, and that's all right. Uh, I, this, 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 this has been so much fun, Jeff. Uh, I want to do this again soon, but I have two questions for you right now. Uh, well, Brandon, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Oh, it's been, been so much fun. Um, I think that's good. You've you mentioned, you know, you know Got to be the hundred present. You played so many characters. Bugs is different than almost any other character in modern fiction and modern Bugs. I, there's a reason he's the one I think that everybody like I'm a bathroom partisan, yes, but Bugs is the one that, you know, 
get fit enough when you think of it. He, he was on the Warner Brothers logo for so long. You know, what is, and you've gone and kind of played with different versions of bugs, like I was saying earlier. What is it about bugs that makes them enduring? Like, we've seen him across all these different interpretations. We've seen him grow. Like, the original Bugs is different than what he became on the Chuck. And then we, he, he, that's different than what he became kind of in the 80s and 90s. He's different than what Bugs is now. I, I have a real soft spot for the LinkedIn show, which I know it was like, and the fact that they played Bugs as a sitcom character. Like, what is it about Bugs you think that makes them so un- enduring as kind of as a character? Mm, well, you know, Chuck Jones said Daffy Duck. Uh, Bugs Bunny is who we all want to aspire to be, and Daffy Duck is who we're stuck with. And so th- that was his assessment of it. And I think there's a lot to be said there. But I, I think we love Bugs in any incarnation because who doesn't want to be the hero? Who doesn't want to have a, a superpower? His superpower is that he's witty. He has an intellect. He's wily, not wily e. coyote, but clever and imaginative and always comes out on top. And so I kind of think we 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 like that. It's true, Doc. I'm a rabbit, all right. Would you like to shoot me now or wait till I get home? Shoot him now! Shoot him now! I mean, <laughs> um, it's it's you know da- both Daffy and Bugs are very alpha characters in the Looney Tunes show. What I thought was really interesting, and I don't know that I realized it when I was doing it. Yes, Daffy was. He came out a little stronger in terms of the jokes, but Bugs was always the one that was still really cool, you know, that that wasn't trying to be cool and would say things to Daffy like, Daffy, you, you, what are you, you out of your mind? You're going to leave the house with that outfit or that, you know? And so I thought that was, was clever the way the writers played that, you know, that Daffy was like Sam or like Elmer. He was the fall guy. He was the buffoon. I, love, so, I, yeah. I, I always get back to what I was in because I went to film school and uh, that's why I went to university was for, for screenwriting and I had to explain to somebody once about how like comedy bits because I also did like uh, so I'm sketch writing and second city and I was explaining to somebody how comedy how my brand of comedy works I explained the Daffy Duck rule which is uh, they he can only win the second he doesn't think he's going to win and then as soon as he has confidence he has to get knocked back down it's <laughs> not it's very good. It's so true. And 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 perfect example was he's leaving the house in the Looney Tunes show in a scene and he has a he has a, a purse on. And Bug says, Daffy, Daffy, you're leaving the house with a purse. It's not a purse. It's a clutch. There's a difference. And you obviously don't know. And I just thought, oh, my God, oh my God, that's. So funny. That's so insane. It's one of my favorite things about the show is still the the, the reveal that the, <laughs> the line around his neck is, from, is diamonds from his grandmama. Yeah. It's beautiful as you, grandmama. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, and I got a last big question. And speaking of you know, Bugs and Daffy as well, because what would you say has been the biggest surprise? That you've discovered kind of getting with these characters. Looking back when you first kind of got start playing them, when you like what you've gotten to discover in these different interpretations of them, what has been the biggest surprise about Bugs and, and Daffy to be honest? Well, the biggest surprise uh, that's happened in recording them uh, for okay, hmm, oh, well, um, well, well, okay, certainly. Certainly the way the writers have been able to write differently. So if we take the Looney Tunes show, Daffy was a little more of the the alpha character. Bugs was a little more the straight man. And Porky, Porky was very interesting. I loved how Porky was portrayed on the show because Porky always got dumped on. Mm-hmm. And he was always, he was Daffy's fall guy. So Daffy always took advantage of Porky. You know, whether it was like Porky, what kind of name is Porky? What what is that? And and so he always he was always getting on on Porky. And and so I, I just I love the fact that you can do so much with those with those characters. I mean, you know, Sam and Elmer um were kind of always portrayed the same. I've always loved the fact that Sylvester 
is the most, I think, the most interesting character because he lives in two universes. Sylvester lives in the universe where he's a dad Mm -hmm. and he lives in the universe where he's a pet. And those two haven't really crossed, which which I which I think it'd be fun if they did. Um, but that's just my idea. But I think he's maybe the most interesting character because he's a father to Sylvester Jr. Um, and but he's also a pet for Granny. Well, I love, you're, you're not. Uh, that's an interesting way of it because I never thought of it like that. And Sylvester also is one of the ones who, more than almost anybody, can shift on that protagonist antagonist line really easily because you get the one three fighting. He's trying to get. He's trying to get Sweden. He's trying to get Sweden. But then you get the ones where he's with Porky, which were also some of my favorites. And like my wife and I still do those ones on Saturday morning sometimes. Well, kind of claws yeah, I, mean, I, it- I just love the fact that his character is so is so vulnerable, and I, I like it when Sylvester's, you know. But he's also boastful as well. And of course, again, like Daffy, that just never that never goes well. And and he has a son that's so precocious, that's so bright. But yet he loves his father and then kind of accepts him for who who he is. There's that little scene where they're sitting around the campfire and Sylvester says, you're getting to be a big boy now, son. And there comes a time we must discuss some of the mysteries of life. Yes, father. What do you wish to know? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, now the first thing a cat's got to know is how to catch mice. Gosh, father, you really know your stuff, I think. And so there's such a such a charm uh, about their the affection, uh, you know, that they have with each other. That I'm, the, they might be some of my favorite, um, you know, duet characters. Oh. All right. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the dog. This has been so much fun. This has been, this has been a blast. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, I I, and I, I hope I've proven I, I grew up with these characters. I love these characters. I love your. I've always loved your work with these characters. Uh, this has been an absolute blast. <laughs> it's been so much uh, fun. Thank you, Brandon, so much. And and much congratulations to you and your wife again. And thank lots you. of success. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, have a good rest of your day. A good rest of having many more of these you got to get through. And I really, really hope I can talk again soon. <laughs> I'm certain of it. I'm certain of it, Brandon. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.